coronavirus. The overall uh, coronavirus case count uh, looks like it's t- it's trending uh, in a better direction than we saw just a few days ago. We still are getting the update from the state of Florida that hospitalizations continue to rise as well as the death count in that state. So a lot of questions uh, right now concerning whether or not we're out of the woods yet and hopefully moving in the right direction. Joining us now for more on what we should be thinking about uh, is Dr. Amish Adalja, a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And Dr. Adalja, I just want to I want to start, uh, you know, maybe with the updates that we heard from Dr. Anthony Fauci. He was uh, interviewed this morning on Good Morning America and, and kind of responded to uh, some attempts, I guess you could call them, from President Trump retweeting some things out there that might undermine uh, his authority. He responded to those saying that he has not been misleading the American public under any circumstances. Uh, But just kind of curious to get your take right now on where we're at through all this, especially as we see these squabbles uh, at the federal level and states kind of taking all this uh, under their own jurisdiction. Well, I think that we're in in a very precarious place with this virus. We've seen some gains in the Northeast where places like New York City have gained really strong control of the virus, but then you've seen control slip in some parts of the Southwest and in the South. And this is going to be the norm as we move forward because the virus hasn't gone anywhere. It's established itself in the human population. When people socially interact, there's going to be cases. The key question will be, have states invested in the public health infrastructure in order to keep those cases to to a minimum and to keep chains of transmission from landing on vulnerable people? And many states have not uh, in, invested in contact tracers, and we still have this testing problem where outpatient tests may take seven to eight days, and that's going to just lead to more and more flare-ups until we get this solved. And you talk about some of those states moving in the opposite direction in terms of guidelines even coming from the White House. We heard from Dr. Deborah Burks, uh, the advisor here alongside Dr. Anthony Fauci on the task force, to talk about what more these states could be doing, mainly saying that Tennessee should mainly close its bars and limit indoor uh, dining to prevent uh, what you're describing here, the, the bad news on the coronavirus front. And just a few seconds after that, we got the update from Governor Bill Lee saying that he had no plans to follow that recommendation. So uh, I guess what are the concerns there when we think about even these guidelines, pretty simple guidelines uh, to prevent the spread of this still not getting followed in some of these states? What you see really is evasion. Early on in the pandemic, we saw evasion at the federal level from the president uh, and the way he handled this. And now you're seeing it with at the governor level, where governors are not taking the correct actions. They are making the wrong they're taking the wrong actions. And when you look at the epidemiology, it's clear not every activity leads to spread. But what we're seeing is that indoor dining and bars seem to be coming up in many different case contact investigations. And there are simple ways to actually attack that with precision guided public health. We're not asking for blanket shutdowns or anything like that. It's trying to find those activities where people are transmitting and make them safer and reduce the harm from this virus. So I do think it's important when you have data that shows you what's leading to transmission that you take action and not ignore the science. And I think this is going to be, again, another theme of this pandemic is that there's so much public health and scientific data out there, but it's often ignored and evaded for whatever reason. Yeah, it's not just, I mean, it's not just uh, the governor level, as you're talking about here. Uh, evading data seems to be a theme through all this and on the, not not just the problem side of it and trying to track where these cases are coming from, but also on the treatment side. In a very strange case to discuss, uh, President Trump retweeting, uh, I guess, a video here that we saw on the Breitbart account talking about hydroxychloroquine, one of those treatments, again, that he's been pushing for, even though the science there, the data at best showed no improvement in clinical outcomes and at worst showed a significantly higher incidence of adverse events with hydroxychloroquine in the use of COVID-19 patients. His son, Donald Trump Jr.'s uh, Twitter account was actually suspended for 12 hours after he also retweeted some of that. Um, I don't know why this keeps coming up, but but what's your take on, on why this misinformation and all this out there on the treatment front still is a problem this far into this? It's baffling to me. We've done study after study there, and we've not seen any benefit from hydroxychloroquine. This was an important question to answer. And I do think, to me, we have sufficient answers on whether this is beneficial in the treatment of coronavirus, and it is not. However, there are people, for whatever reason, are clinging to this in an irrational manner, and this misinformation has actually become distracting to clinicians because people are now still asking for hydroxychloroquine. People are mixing up hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir and not wanting remdesivir because they think it's hydroxychloroquine or vice versa. It's really just an, another example of politicians involving themselves in something they have no business being involved in. This is something that, that is a scientific question, a medical question, and whatever a politician or a real estate developer thinks about this drug is irrelevant, and we shouldn't actually be giving it any credence because it is cognitively meaningless. 
Yeah, and we're, we're seeing that play out now on the social media platforms as well. But when you talk about politics, it's hard to really divorce that from the discussions playing out right now as we approach the school uh, term here in the fall. And interesting uh, updates on that front, kind of, I guess, shifting the conversation in a much more realistic uh, manner as we got the update from the U.S.'s largest, second largest, I should say, uh, teachers union saying it would support its 1.7 million members to strike in districts that don't seem to think uh, safety measures are being followed closely enough. Mainly they point out that they would want to see positivity test rates below 5%, and that is not the norm right now. A New York Times analysis found that only about two of the nation's 10 largest school districts would actually fall under that threshold. So when you think about this, now teachers, the ones who would be putting themselves into this uh, environment here and, and taking on the risks, if they say they don't want to go back until they see that positivity rate come down below 5%, how realistic is it that we would even get schools reopened in the fall? I do think that some schools are going to be able to reopen, and some already did in states like Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, even in some school districts in Tennessee have opened. This isn't something that we can do on a one-size-fits-all type of basis. It's really going to be school district by school district looking to see what, what the pandemic is doing in that given area, what measures a given school has put into place to keep the spread of the virus from going. But this is something that should be a priority. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine have all endorsed this. Uh, but we can't let politics get involved in this. We have data that we can actually use to guide us in opening schools. And I do think that this is something we, we want to do. But we do need to get control of the outbreak. And if the outbreak is out of control in a given community, there's no way to keep it from spilling into a school. So I, I do think this is something that we have to solve as quickly as possible. And lastly, I just want to get your thoughts on the timeline that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci did reiterate on there, talking about uh, all these vaccine candidates here, still hoping, cautiously optimistic that we're going to get uh, in the late fall an answer on whether or not one of these vaccine uh, candidates can actually start rolling out to the public. What's your take on maybe looking at that late fall timeline, and whether or not we can get something by September, November, October? So I do think that we'll, we will start getting data by late fall, understanding the safety and the efficacy in phase three clinical trials where the virus is actually uh, facing people that have been vaccinated. And that's really where we understand whether or not this vaccine is safe and effective in a large population group. But it's one thing to just have data and be able to manufacture 300 million doses for the American population. So I do think we, we still have a ways to go. And vaccine development is something that usually takes years, not months. So it is something that's in the realm of possibility that we have some batches of vaccine may be available late at the end of this year, early next year, but that's going to probably be for high-risk individuals and healthcare workers, part of priority groups. So it is going to take some time to distribute this vaccine throughout the entire country and the entire world if everything goes perfectly in phase three clinical trials and during manufacturing scale-up. All right, the latest there on the timeline front uh, from Senior Scholar at Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, Dr. Amish Adalja, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you.